So this is a video for my family. My family reunion it happens every five years. This reunion brings together descendants of Mildred and Rudolf Settlemeyer and their families. If we make a diagram of Mildred and Rudy's descendants, it looks kind of like a root system. And if we map out their ancestors going back a few generations, they fan out overhead like spreading branches and we get a classic family tree. Or you might say it looks like an hourglass shape. That's a symbol for the passage of time, which seems to fit pretty well when you're looking at 200 years of history. But since we read from left to right, I'd like to turn the hourglass on its side, and I'd like to make it into a, a timeline so we can see how lives and generations overlapped. When I put it all together, the whole thing looks like this. This diagram encompasses nine generations and some 60 or 70 people, half of whom are alive and with us today. Now, I've done a little bit of research into the other half. I could tell you the life story for each one of these individuals with you know, varying levels of accuracy and detail, but that might tax your patience. Admittedly, this whole thing is a little bit overwhelming, so let me break it down for you. This will be nine generations in nine minutes. Let's start with the immigrant, immigrant generation. This whole branch of the family tree is descended from 15 immigrants who came to America, mostly in the 1830s and the 1840s. They were all different people, each with a unique story, but they did have some things in common. For example, they all came from Germany. Or did they? Actually, Germany, as we know it, did not exist back then. It might be better to say that they came from a number of different German-speaking places in Europe. The continent was a chaos of shifting political boundaries and frequent wars, but this may not have affected the daily lives of our ancestors so much. What did affect them was the burgeoning population, the high rate of poverty, and the lack of opportunity. They came to America seeking a better life. So this is what we could say about them generally. They definitely spoke German, they were almost certainly poor, and they probably came from farming families. Oh yes, and they were Lutheran. They came by ship. The only time they ever saw the ocean was when they crossed it, and they maybe didn't see much of it even then, because this was no pleasure cruise. Some of them were quite young, some of them came with parents or siblings, some of them came alone. Some came as advance scouts and sent word back to their families in the old world. They came through Philadelphia and Baltimore and made their way inland via waterways or overland on wagons or by foot. Conrad Trier is said to have walked all the way from Pennsylvania to Indiana twice. And they were the first trickle of what would become a mighty wave of German immigration to 19th century America. It was an America very different from the country we know today. Women could not vote. Slavery was still legal. Most of the land was still forested. It got really dark at night because there was no electricity. They all settled in Allen County, Indiana, around the city of Fort Wayne, not in the city itself. Though European immigrants kept arriving, there were lots of indigenous people living there too. The state of Indiana was named after them. Fort Wayne had been established at the site of a town called Kekionga. The Miamis, the Weas, the Piankishaw, as well as the Shawnee were just some of the nations in this area that we now call Allen County. Through a series of legal maneuvers and armed conflicts, uh, the United States government took control of this land. Mo many of the First Nations were removed to reservations in the West, but many remained. Our ancestors benefited from this arrangement by acquiring land in the rural areas and establishing farms. In some cases, that meant clearing the land themselves. Slowly, they began the process of transforming the landscape into something closer to what we know today. One pair came already married, but for the most part, they found spouses here in the New World. And it's not surprising that without exception, they all married other German immigrants like themselves. They formed eight couples. Now, I know what you're wondering. How do 15 individuals make eight couples? Something doesn't add up. And you're right, there's a story here. In 1846, Hermann Heinrich Settlemeyer fell from the rafters of the construction site of St. Paul's Lutheran Church. He died, and his son, Hermann Rudolph, was born five months later. The widow Maria remarried the following year and had four more children with Karl Poehler, including Eliza Poehler. The weird twist came many years later when Herman Rudolph's grandson, Rudy, married Eliza's granddaughter, Mildred, but I'm getting ahead of myself. As noted, the immigrant generation reproduced. Their children might be called American natives, not to be confused with Native Americans, but they still spoke German. All these families had multiple children, but eight in particular were our direct ancestors. This second generation was born from 1840 to just before the Civil War. They were all raised in farm families in rural Allen County, and they were all farmers too. One of them, William Hockemeyer, had a side career in local politics, 
And let me tell you, there was some scorching invective, political cartoons on the front page of the Fort Wayne papers. Uh, it kind of proves that today's partisan rhetoric is nothing new. So these eight, an these eight ancestors found each other. They married off in the late 1800s and began to have kids of their own before the century was over. Once again, they were German-speaking farmers around Allen County. While the last of the immigrant generation died off, this third generation grew up, paired up, got married, and had kids. Louise and Louis Settlemeyer brought forth Rudolph in 1908. Ida and Paul Holman had Mildred, their only child, in 1912. They would be the last generation of German-speaking farmers in our family. World War I happened, and Germans were vilified in the press and in government propaganda. After the war, Indiana outlawed the teaching of German in elementary schools, even private and parochial schools. The era of German-speaking communities in America was over. In a span of about 15 years, all the members of the second generation died off. By the time Rudy and Mildred got married in 1936, Rudy's parents had died as well. Of all their ancestors, only Ida and Paul remained. It must have seemed like a changing of the guard. Mildred and Rudy had three children, all daughters, Ruth, Gloria, and Judy. World War II soon followed uh, after, and even bigger shifts in our society. You know, one of the most striking things is that all our ancestors had moved around so very little after that big migration from Europe. You know, a few cousins went here and there, but for the most part, they stayed put in and around Allen County. But Ruth, Gloria, and Judy all moved away. They got married and started families in the 1960s in California, Texas, and Oklahoma. It was just a, another time of massive change. At the end of 1963, Mildred and Rudy went out to visit Gloria's new family in California to check out the Rose Bowl. And while they were gone, their house in Fort Wayne burned down. So they built a new one, uh, which I should mention, you know, all these farmers were fairly prosperous. The new farmhouse retained a homey feel and remained a meeting place for family reunions. In fact, at a gathering for Christmas, 1964, in the new farmhouse, Rudy suggested the extended family should make a regular thing of it every five years. Now, I missed that first reunion because I hadn't been born yet, but I made the second one in 1969. By this time, my family had actually moved back to Indiana, but it was to suburban Indianapolis, not the farming life in Allen County. Paul was still alive, by the way. Ida had died in 1958, but Paul moved in with Mildred and Rudy, and he stayed with them until the end, almost the end, of his very long life. In this branch of the family, at least, Paul was the only member of his generation that got to meet my generation. In 1974, we did the Christmas reunion again. Grandpa Rudy made a tape recording of the event, interviewing everybody there, including my cousin Tammy, reciting a prayer in Korean. She'd been adopted earlier that year. My generation was now complete. There were eight of us great grandkids in all. Well, Paul's life ended in late 1978, followed by Rudy's untimely death in a farming accident the following spring. That left Mildred as a widow for the next 20 years. We celebrated four more family reunions with her. Or roughly speaking, my generation got married toward the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. The eighth generation began with Shauna, who was born in 1982 and ends probably, almost certainly, with the birth of my daughter Persephone in 2008. Yet another generation began with the birth of Kylie's son, Jaden, in 2007. So counting from the immigrants who came over from Europe in the early 19th century, Jaden represents the ninth generation in this story. So there you have it. Nine generations in nine minutes. How'd I do? <laughs>